Welcome, everybody, as people start to join us here in the room. My name is Sean Casemore. I'll be your host for today's event. So as normal, it's top of the hour. We've uh, opened up the room and people are piling in. Watch your step. Uh, what we're going to do is get started here in just probably one to two minutes. I like to give everybody enough time to get in, get settled. So uh, just stay tuned here as we uh, pile into the room. Maybe uh, actually it shouldn't be crowded. You should have lots of space. Um, but uh, yeah, just stay tuned. We're going to get started in about a minute or so here. Just give everybody time to jump in. So hold tight. And I'm just testing the audio here. Sean, you can hear me okay? You're good, Perfectly. Mark. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to share my screen at this stage or not? Sure, sure. Doesn't hurt. So again, for those of you just joining us here, we've got quite a few signed up for today's event. So we're just going to give it another minute here, make sure everybody gets a chance to uh, see this from the start. Uh, so just uh, stay, stay tuned. Uh, you probably have enough time to run for a really quick coffee if you want to. So uh, we're just going to give it one more minute here before we get, uh, get started and jump into today. So just bear with us. That uh, looks good, Mark. So you're good to go there. We'll just uh, give another minute here. Just a quick technical question, Sean, on Zoom. Unlike Teams, will it automatically share the audio uh, in the PowerPoint, do you think? Uh, that is a very good question. I think it will. We'll, we'll, we'll find we'll out. Pretty quick. Yeah, we'll know pretty quick. Okay. All right. So everybody uh, joining us here today, I think we've got, uh, just, so you, just so you know, just so, so you're aware of, of the impact these events are having. Uh, for manufacturers across Canada and, and technology companies, obviously, uh, we had over 100 people signed up for today's event. Now, if you've attended any events, what you may learn is that you never get everybody here that you that had signed up. But as you also know, we share the recording of these events out with you so that you can watch them for 30 days. Uh, I think that's the time limit that Zoom gives us. And then we transfer that over to the NGEN uh, YouTube channel. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure if you couldn't make this event today, you've always got this in your hands, but clearly this is a, a, a topic that is, uh, the timing is right for all of our members across Canada. So my name is Sean Casemore. I want to welcome you officially to today's event. If you haven't seen or heard from me, then you've probably never been to these events. I'm, uh, I guess I'd call myself your host, uh, and I'm joined uh, my, by my, uh, partner in crime, uh, Frank DeFalco. He's our uh, director of membership for NGEN, and he's uh, sitting in the background supporting us as well. Uh, before I jump into introducing today's guest and today's topic, you'll see in front of you, uh, as we normally do with these events, we realize that the Q&A doesn't always provide sufficient time for you to ask questions, for you to share ideas and share uh, best practices, things that you're doing. So as with these events, we normally have a round table the following Thursday, uh, we used to have them at 10 a.m. We've moved them to 11 to try and line up the times for everybody. So if you found you know, interest from today's conversation, uh, whether you're watching this after the fact or you're here live with us and you'd like to attend a, a brief roundtable, there's no more than an hour to share ideas and learn more best practices. Mark is also going to be joining us there. He's today's speaker. Uh, we hope you will join us. It will be next Thursday, March 4th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You will see an email coming from me. I will uh, share with you the slides from today, as well as remind you to, if you'd like to attend, to let me know, and then I'll send the link out to you. Okay, so stay tuned for that. You'll see an email from me with more information. And again, the whole point of that roundtable is to continue the dialogue that we'll be having here today. So before I turn it over to our speaker, I would be remiss of not giving a brief introduction, but I'll give a brief introduction actually of today's presentation, because it's a little bit different. This is ultimately today's presentation that Mark Kirby is going to walk us through. It's an overview of the additive manufacturing ecosystem in Canada from an industry research and training perspective. Uh, it covers both technology developments, application highlights, and regulatory differences and lessons learned from a hands-on industry engagement. So Mark will share more about where did that engagement come from, ultimately, uh, but NGEM was involved, and hence this is uh, information we think you're going to find very timely. Now, let me introduce our speaker today, Mark Kirby. After graduating MIT 
In aero and astro engineering, Mark jo joined Rolls Royce in the UK, working on air breathing rocket engines, as he describes them before moving to his father's machine shop, Jet Blades. Mark worked from all his way up from CAD programmer to managing director, uh, making parts for Formula One teams and Rolls Royce jet engines. In 2007, he immigrated to the Maritimes in Canada with his family, uh, and he provides uh, provided hand on hands on coaching for companies introducing advanced lights out manufacturing. He joined. Renishaw in 2013 to head their Canadian additive manufacturing business and start up their first North American solution center. And then in 2020, Mark moved to the University of Waterloo to, to lead industry training for additive manufacturing. So there is nobody better positioned to speak not only about the results of this survey, but about additive manufacturing in Canada than Mark Kirby. So with that said, Mark, uh, if you can hear me, I'm going to turn it over to you and mute myself. Great. Well, uh, thanks for that, uh, Sean. I like the way you led into that. Nobody better positioned. Well, let's take this position up, shall we? Here we have, uh, we're on board the space shuttle. Obviously, I'm a rocket scientist by training, uh, and Canada is in the background there, and the Canada arm in the foreground. Uh, lots of exciting developments recently with Perseverance landing on Mars. And, you know, hopefully it's a, it's a bright future. Technology is going to be our friend. Um, so uh, I'm going to try and take you around Canada. Um, so uh, please keep your hands and feet inside the ride at all times and uh, hang on. Hopefully this will be fun. So uh, why is added? This is the most boring bit of the presentation, by the way. Um, why is additive manufacturing important? Well, according to Wohlers, maybe it's $6.8 billion worth of parts being manufactured. That's parts, not, not machines. That's parts. And it's growing at a pretty regular 20%. So it's a growth industry. However, global manufacturing added value is $14 trillion. So it's easy to dismiss additive as, well, you know, it's really not that important. However, the projection is that it will represent 1% of all manufacturing in future. And that would be worth about $2 billion to Canada's GDP. And in terms of our crystal ball, um, you know, uh, I think one of the messages I'd like you to take away is disruption. Who of you had global pandemic is going to have us all working from home for the next uh, 18 months in your corporate strategic plan? I don't think anybody did. Um, so we don't really know exactly how it's going to be disruptive. And by definition, disruption happens where you least expect it. So I just ask if you look, look at this through the lens of not why it doesn't apply to you, but how could it apply to you? Try to look at it through a positive lens. I think it's, it's easy to look at it through a negative lens. Okay, so um, We've, we did a survey uh, across Canada, uh, and here's, there's a link to this uh, to our results. And we covered everything from plastic printing. That's the kind of thing that maybe you've got in your basement at home or your kids have got, um, all the way through to this is really what additive manufacturing looks like in Canada. That's a massive die casting tool with conformally cooled inserts produced by Exco who are one of the leading companies, you know, I'm going to big them up, but I'm going to say in the world on this. So if we look across Canada, very roughly, um, there are about a thousand polymer machines, um, excluding hobbyist machines, the ones in your basement. And they're the order of a hundred metal machines of all descriptions, whether it's laser powder bed, DED, electron beam, binder jet. So the, we, we literally, we've got additive manufacturing from coast to coast. Um, most of the installations in Quebec and Ontario, um, but I'm gonna take you coast to coast today. He hopes. Okay, there we go. So the, we formed an advisory board with about 30 members from across Canada, uh, um, from all different sectors. Uh, and really, this represents literally hundreds of years of experience. I was going to make it thousands, but I don't think everybody's got 30 years experience in it. But it's literally hundreds of years of experience. And many of the people who are part of NGEN's Additive Manufacturing Advisory Board really are all in, um, you know, they're, they're betting everything on this. So they're highly committed, 
they're highly passionate. And as you can imagine, not everybody has the same point of view. So the survey has some interesting reading. Uh, here, are, here are some snippets from it for you. I'm not gonna read them out. Uh, there's, there are many more sound bites inside the, uh, inside the white paper that we've done. But here are just a few of them. So hopefully you can read quickly. Okay, so one of the one of the interesting things on technology adoption is, you know, what why why do you go out and spend money? And uh, I had, to be honest, I had expected the answer here to be a lot more on the left hand side, that it was, you know, I went and invested in the equipment when I had the order in my hand. Somewhat surprisingly, um, we can see that in Canada we 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 maybe. Uh, we're a bit more risk taking. Uh, so the, the big orange bar is most people bought this to expand into a new market. It was a speculative investment as opposed to it was it was a done deal. And I think that was that was a little bit of a surprise. Um, but again, you know, I think we're being we're being pioneers. And hopefully one of the things you'll take away from today's trip around Canada is that um, you know, we're a big country geographically, we're small in terms of population and and maybe market size, but we we always seem to punch above our weight. This is a very complicated, complicated uh, SWOT analysis where we tried to ask people what do they think of the strengths uh, of the Canadian landscape and what are the what are the weaknesses or the threats. The black line, um, starting from sort of positive on the left and negative on the right. So uh, unsurprisingly, customers are seen as a real positive as is innovation and competitors on the far right are seen as uh, as a bit of a negative a little bit little bit hard uh, because everybody has a different viewpoint on uh, strengths and strengths and weaknesses uh, and again hopefully today you'll be able to form your own opinion of what you think the strengths and weaknesses of the am landscape is across canada so let's you know we talked about disruption we, we're all being disrupted by the current pandemic um, 3d printing certainly um, has been uh, um, a technology that has that has helped. We've all tried to help. Um, I'm going to have to miss out today more than I can include. Uh, when I said there are you know thousand plastic uh, in, uh, institutions and a hundred metal ones, uh, then you can see that I'm going to miss out a lot more. I'm trying to show some of the things maybe you haven't seen, uh, but here are some examples. We've got Exergy uh, and uh, Renishaw and Starfish all working uh, on how do we use 3D printing to help uh, alleviate the crisis, whether it's making ventilators, whether it's making PPE. And of course, NGen has supported a lot of work uh, with vaccine development. So um, I'm gonna take a dive uh, into uh, one of the companies. So I said I'd take you around Canada today uh, and uh, hopefully this is going to play. Uh, okay, our movies are not going to play. That's a bit of a blow. Okay. Let me just See if can I can, do let me just see if I can get this get this to play here. Maybe it will play. If, if it doesn't, we can include the link in the uh, follow up email. Okay. Well, um, that I'm just going to drop. I'm just going to drop out of this and see if we can get it to play out of uh, screen sharing. Let's just see if we can get it to play the kind of uh, old fashioned way here. Okay. Well, fortunately, I haven't got too many videos today. So that was going to take us to Precision ADM, who are producing the nasal swab, among other things. And this has now become the world's uh, highest volume uh, printed medical device. That, that's quite an accolade for Canada. Um, and there were some very good reasons why 3D printing was the right solution, including some late changes to exactly how these 
the, the geometry of these swabs. And again, 3D printing is great to accommodate that versus say injection molding, uh, where making changes to tooling is not fast. Um, so 3D printing has certainly proven itself. And there was a very interesting interview I did with Martin Patrak, CEO. Um, and I think he was, he was surprisingly, he's always candid and he admitted even he wasn't sure that 3D printing could really scale to millions of devices like it has done. So that, that's you know, a tremendous success story for, for Canada. Um, now I'm going to take you all the way to the, uh, so we started in the middle of Canada there in Manitoba. We're going to go all the way to Prince Edward Island now to a company called Tronos Jet. Uh, Tronos Jet was uh, founded in 2001. It's a relatively small company, about 30 people. Um, they're an aircraft lesser and trader. Their speciality is the British Aerospace 146 or uh, Avro RJ. Uh, and they have uh, traded, sold, and delivered about 60 of these aircraft across the world. And in 2004, they uh, formed a heavy maintenance organization. Uh, let me just get my notes to be correct here. They are actually, um, it is a FAA EASA Transport Canada approved maintenance organization um, doing heavy maintenance on these aircraft. Uh, and they subsequently embarked on the design modifications to modify the aircraft to be a 3000 gallon water bomber. Um, and they achieved an FAA supplemental type certificate for this. So this is, as you can imagine, this is not a trivial exercise in terms of regulations um, to modify an aircraft like this. So uh, they did that. And in 2011, the water bomber entered service with the US Forestry Commission. Uh, and in 2015, they sold the intellectual property to their customer uh, in the US. So they subsequently exited that successfully. And now that is owned um, by a company, I think Neptune in the US. Um, so in 2019, Tronos decided to leverage their intimate knowledge of the aircraft market um, and their, cert their regulatory experience with certification and look to diversify using additive manufacturing. And they put in three machines, as you can see here at the top. Um, and one of the first projects that they are actually well on their way to getting uh, what's called a parts manufacturing authorization PMA for is this engine control bracket shown in black here. This controls the throttle cables um, that run to all of the engines. Of course, being a British design, we managed to have many, many engines and many, many brackets. I think there are 16 of these brackets in an airplane. Um, these were originally magnesium. Um, they do have a finite life. They suffer from corrosion and they are a um, cat one critical part. Um, you can imagine you can't fly if that bracket is faulty in any way. So, um, Getting hold of these brackets now is a very lengthy and expensive process. Uh, the world's most expensive part is the one you haven't got. And again, Tronos are looking here uh, at where is the pain for their customers and where can additive manufacturing make sense to them and their customers? Where, where is there a business case? And there is a business case here. So they're looking to get this component, which is a CAT1 component, but it's fairly lightly loaded and is therefore going to be printed in titanium rather than in magnesium. And Tronos have invested not only in the metallography that's required to do them to validate the materials performance, but also the physical testing. Um, so they're going to pull this poor bracket to pieces, I think. Uh, and so, you know, again, I said at the beginning that these companies I'm talking about are really all in. Um, and I think Tronos is a good example of this, but maybe coming at it from a, a fairly well-informed position where they're looking to leverage their existing knowledge of the market. So I realize a lot of you won't be in aircraft. I think we've got people from IMP on the, on the call today. You're obviously in aircraft. So there are some people who are in aircraft, but all of you know who your customers are, know your markets. And you know maybe this is a good model for how you can use additive to um, leverage your knowledge of the market to diversify and to relieve um, some of your customer pain. So 
uh, this is hot off the press. We're in Sherbrooke now, um, Productique Quebec. And uh, this is a, a research technology organization that has been going for quite some time, helping customers across Canada, uh, adopting advanced manufacturing. Uh, this is their layout of their cell that they have, which is dedicated to what I would call <laughs> modestly conventional manufacturing. It may not look like your shop floor, uh, but it's the kind of stuff that Product Quebec does where it's looking at how do we automate all of this how, and how do we learn, how do we constantly improve uh, what we're doing by feeding back from inspection um, so that we can develop business intelligence, artificial uh, and, uh, and uh, these kind of models. The exciting thing that uh, they're doing is they're entering the additive space uh, and in particular, the big ring at the top, they're looking at uh, part process and finishing, which I think is a neglected area um, and it's a painful area. Um, but it's also, of course, one way you can differentiate yourself uh, by being excellent in it. So um, Productive Quebec, um, it's a great resource for Canada. Um, they do serve all of Canada. They are in Sherbrooke, fantastic place to go skiing. I am an absolutely terrible skier. Um, but uh, great, great people. Vincent Thomaset uh, is in charge of that operation and he's hiring new people for this. This, this is very, very exciting. And they have um, a very clear vision for where they're going to try and go. And again, I would see um, this is, uh, you know, for Canadian customers, big and small, how are you going to de-risk? Uh, this would be a, this would be a great place um, to uh, learn with. And here is their sort of roadmap. Um, and this is Tim Simpson's uh, maturity model, the thermometers in the background. It's an interesting model for maybe, you know, where would you measure yourself? What's your plan in terms of uh, additive adoption? Okay. Uh, let's, we've had a look at some, uh, some organizations. Let's have a look at some, some material. Uh, let's look at aluminum, uh, or aluminum, um, but let's call it aluminum. And, uh, yes, aluminum is lighter than steel, uh, the, as the graph on the right says, so we can make things, uh, lighter maybe if we use aluminum and there's a lot of light weighting going on across a whole variety of industries. Um, for um, greenhouse gas emission reduction, a whole variety of reasons. But the graph on the right at the bottom is kind of the kicker. Um, and what it's showing is that unless we can make uh, the feedstock significantly cheaper, and here this is saying a factor of 10, we're not really going to reach the billions of dollars um, that is the potential of the market there. And I think this story is true not just of aluminium, but of all um, all materials, cost reduction is uh, definitely high on everybody's agenda for these for these technologies. So this material's been provided by uh, a small but beautifully formed company called Equispheres, and that's exactly what their powder is: uh, small and beautifully formed. Uh, and um, they're out of they're operating out of Ottawa, and they are one of one of several uh, material suppliers that we have in Canada. We're very rich in uh, material suppliers knowledge. And of course, it's the kind of IKEA model that we want to go for where we don't just want to sell you trees. You know, we want to sell you furniture and we don't just want to sell you powder. We want to sell you components. We want to add the value here in Canada. Um, so uh, Equispheres, um, uh believe that with that, but don't, don't believe they have white papers published on, on this and that because the powder allows uh, a very consistent process that you can not only get higher design allowables, 30%, you know, what's 30% worth to you if you're in a high performance regime, uh, but also you can go significantly quicker. Um, here they're saying three to four times faster potentially and that's worth an awful lot when these machines are expensive. So if the machines run faster, there's a very big economic case, um, even for using feedstock that maybe isn't 10 times cheaper. So again, there's a complex balance here, but we've got a very rich um, ecosystem in terms of materials and materials expertise in Canada. 
So I was going to take you now all the way to the West Coast um, to a company that has just been purchased. It was previously known as Rapedia, but it is now part of the X1 family. Uh, and um, X1 is one of the one of the giants in uh, 3D printing, probably best well known for uh, printing sand molds. Um, so you can print your mold and then fill it with any metal that you like. That's a fantastic value proposition. Um, and uh, but they also do 3D 3D printing uh, with binder jetting, um, and now with the Metal Design Lab, which is has been developed here in Canada. This is a much more affordable FDM machine that lets you print one day and uh, sinter the next, and and have your parts. Um, the the, the, the clever bit about this, and, and again, my apologies, I'm presenting other, other people's work, but trying to do it in an agnostic way. Um, but this is a water-based um, FDM system. Uh, so uh, we have, it, it's very friendly in terms of the, both the economics and the hazards. There's, there's not a debinding step. Um, and we can print internal channels um, using the uh, using the dual head extruder uh, and sinter it the next sinter it the next day. And actually, the de the debinding step that I hadn't realized is actually painful, not just in terms of time, um, but also in terms of maybe the cross sections that you can and can't do with other systems. So if you were looking at an affordable metal system, then again, I would suggest that you know this ought to be you ought to be looking at something like this on uh, on your evaluation. Um, so let's have a look at another machine here in Canada. Check that we're doing good for time. We are. Um, this one is out of Montreal, a company called Nano Grande, Juan Schneider, um, and uh, this is a company producing uh, very high resolution parts. Um, using, if we flip to the next slide, they can briefly um, control the cohesive forces uh, and remove them to allow a very fine uh, layer of powder to be produced uh, and then use binder jet technology to allow very high productivity. So they can produce parts on a resolution that really um, hitherto hasn't really been possible by many systems. So here we have some examples of, of very high resolution parts that can be pr printed quickly. The, the sweet spot for this, um, according to Juan, is something that's maybe up to coffee cup sized. Um, and we're, we're getting very low shrinkages um, with the binder jetting process, like 4%. Four, four so those of you who know that that lets you get retain the very high resolution. So we have high resolution, high productivity. So again, Nano Grande in Montreal maybe ought to be on your radar if you think that that could be um, what you what you might need. Let's uh, have a look now at something that's sort of we've looked at some materials, we've looked at some machines, something that's really maybe the intersection of the two. This is a new company out of Toronto called Metafold. Um, they're working in lattices, they're working in mathematics, uh, and the beauty of lattices, as the uh, diagram on the bottom right shows, is that we can create new material behavior with existing materials. So we're allowing the geometry to work with um, existing materials to expand the performance universe. Um, so these are meta materials. Um, and of course, I couldn't help. I, you know, I always want to come up with a with a soundbite. So I'm going to say, meta materials could be better materials. Um, so you know, what could what could you do with meta materials? One thing that that Metafold are working with is uh, a large sportswear company looking for high performance solutions using this. But again, you know, it's it's definitely a wider area than this. And Metafold are at the intersection of software and hardware. They have their own machines um, that can process these lattices very effectively with no loss of resolution. Um, so, um, you know, lattices, lattices, I think, are almost as misunderstood as artificial intelligence. Um, so, uh, you know, what could you do with uh, with a different material behavior. 
so it, you know if you think that could be of interest then uh, Elisa Ross is the person to speak to at Metafold. Um, this is not going to play which is sad um, this was uh, research across Canada um, I'm sorry that I, I can't play that today um, so let's just um, and so my apologies to all of the fantastic institutions who are working to support development of better materials, better machines, um, bringing down the cost of adoption. Um, so let's just sort of uh, finish up with um, a quick look at training. Um, so this is a little cartoon from uh, the Barnes Group and on the left is uh, what the design engineer thought they were going to get and then on the right anybody who's been in this for a while and has opened up a machine um, whether it was in your basement in a pile of spaghetti from a FDM machine or laser powder bed, um, you've probably had that. Uh, oops, that that wasn't quite quite what we thought. Um, so you know, how do we how do we fix this? Um, that's a good a good question with not a simple answer. This again is from the from the survey in terms of what skill sets are missing, and anything with the colourful bars is sort of cause for concern. And we've got kind of cause for a cause for a concern, um, everything from design and materials knowledge through to uh, the business case itself and, and some of the principles. And I think every institution uh, can play a role in a continuum in terms of how we address this. Um, do we want PhDs operating machines? Probably not. Um, but are PhDs one of Canada's best kept secrets? Or one of, yeah, one of the best kept secrets. Yeah, I think they are in terms of um, being able to add a tremendous amount of insight very cost effectively into an organization. Um, but we also need people need organizations. You have your own people already, so you know you need to get hands on with the technology, and that's really where NGEN fits in, I think, in terms of you saw that that map of Canada with all of the uh, institutions, operations, service providers, resellers who are part of the landscape. And, you know, NGEN's job is to help you connect with these people um, that uh, can, can help you um, on your on your journey. Um, so this was uh, this is just a little example of the journey I've been on recently. Um, looking at making some quite complicated optical devices. Uh, the beautiful rendered image on the left was kind of what we wanted. And this was actually prompted by the little cartoon on LinkedIn. And we got involved in a discussion when one of my colleagues said, hey, I'm really struggling with this, with the team I'm working with. And the struggle was a bit like Gulliver's Travels. Uh, here we have on, on the right in terms of this, these objects were going to be very difficult to print. Um, so we got kind of pretty pretty hands-on with this with the team um, and uh, uh, R, um, really got hands-on with learning how to design for additive and in the space of a, in the space of a few weeks um, we've really had a, a fairly transformational uh, result so again this is this is this is the value of working with within the ecosystem in terms of how do you how do you learn about this and how do we get something um, that is really going to meet requirements. Um, so uh, going uh, again, my video is not going to play at the end here, which is which is a shame. So we're going to be a little bit ahead of time here. But uh, you know, we talked earlier on about disruption and you know how is additive potentially going to disrupt the landscape. Um, and you know, I put there. Well, is it going to be one percent or one point four trillion? Um, is it going to be more than that? And is it is it your is it your one percent that's going to get disrupted? Uh, this is something that Tesla is doing right now, um, you know. And maybe Elon Musk and Tesla and you know they're all companies maybe you love to hate, but you know you shouldn't ignore them. Uh, and they're consolidating parts um, going from the assembly on the left to the one on the right with a massive die casting, um, and this has some interesting uh, ramifications. For example, they're going to need far fewer robots to put their cars together because now they're working with one very big com component. Whether it's conformally cooled or not, I don't know. But 
again, this is an example of disruption within an industry um, because people are thinking about the problems differently. We've got park consolidation here. Um, and I would say that there's some interesting discussion going on within the car industry. Um, clearly, electric vehicles are going to be um, they're here to they're here to stay. Their impact on the you know manufacturing of the internal combustion engine remains to be seen. How that's going to work out. Um, volumes are likely to be different. And, you know, initially, of course, they will be smaller and, and additive ma manufacturing plays very well in that space in terms of no cost tooling, which basically all of the technologies deliver. Um, so I would uh, I would urge you not to ignore additive manufacturing in your in your business. Um, you know, and again, if we think in the automotive industry, you know, maybe you have decades of experience of making six cylinder engines and, and, and will that be a competitive advantage in the future or not? And, you know, what are you going to do about it? Um, so the video doesn't play um, and uh, I'm very happy to, to take Q&A um, now and hope that, you know, hopefully that was a, a quick, a quick tour around and uh, there's certainly going to be more time next week at the round at the round table to discuss it. And I'll back to you, Sean. Thanks, Mark. So as you noticed, unfortunately, we didn't have those videos play. But what we will do, as I mentioned, is we'll include links to those uh, in the follow up email with Mark's slides so that you can play them at your leisure. Um, Technology is always a great thing as long as it works as you intend. So with that said, as, as Mark mentioned, we want to open it up for Q&A. So there's two ways you can do that. You can use the Q&A box uh, along the bottom of your screen, or you can simply type your question into chat. So it does look like we have a Q&A. So the first one here for you, Mark, uh, are there any concern about fatigue properties in lattice structures? The demands of traditional design often seem to stop novel designs in their tracks. Uh, the flippant answer would be, would be no. Y yes, yes, of course, there are, you know, um, the devil is always in the detail. Um, and, you know, additive manufacturing is not, you know, it, it, it's not immune from that. So people who spring to mind in terms of working in this space, Damiano Pacini at, at, at McGill, and again, I'm just going to name people off the top of my head, um, doing some fantastic work in, in exactly this space with um, medical implants, looking at the um, the fatigue performance and, and often what happens when you print something you don't get exactly what you designed um, so you have this model on the on the screen which is often very very difficult to simulate the math the the processing required for lattices the computational approaches that people are taking and that's why you know the company metafold is interesting um, they wind up being really difficult to analyze um, so they're, they're, they're very they're very tempting um, and analyzing what you've actually printed when that's different from what you designed you know if a strut is meant to be 300 microns in diameter but now it's sort of 350 with some wobbles on it how does that really how does that affect your design so people like uh, damiano Pacini at mcgill uh doing some fantastic work there um, in not just in fatigue, Sean, but also in, you know, the as manufactured condition, um, how much does that matter? And we, you know, tools like computer tomography, CT scanning, um, fantastic weapons. And again, I would, I would advise people, uh, you, you know, CT is maybe the first thing that you should do in terms of looking inside your component at the, uh, at the, the what have you actually got in there? Not the last thing that you should do. Uh, definitely change my point of view on that, working with company, uh, research institutions like Waterloo. Um, so. Okay, great. And we have some more here. Uh, next question, uh, yeah, the individual thanks you for the presentation, so that's good. Um, if you had to pick a primary metal material with the best uses cases for laser powder bed fusion, what material would it be? <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to ask that again? Uh, well, the the best material for laser powder bed, um, I'm probably you know I I would gravitate towards titanium as being uh, 
it's expensive, so if we could use less of it, that would be nice, uh, rather than starting with, with lots of stuff. Um, it's high performance, so maybe we really do want the fine features that laser powder bed gives us. Um, so titanium would be probably my go-to, but somebody said, my friend Ian Brooks in the UK, um, one of his sayings is additive manufacturing is a constant hat eating competition. Um, and, and it really is, Sean. You, you just can't, you can't predict. To begin, when I first entered this, I was like, why would anybody want to print aluminium? You know, it just made no sense to me coming very much from a subtractive background. It's like, well, it's really easy. It's really easy to machine. There, there's no, there's no, there's no good answer um, uh, to what is, what is the best material. I think, I think that the best answer is, you know, there's a conundrum between the promise of additive manufacturing, which is this complexity for free, any geometry you want. And then it's a bit like Ford's Model T, isn't it? it's any color as long as it's black, well, any material as long as it's only these three. And, and we definitely have to expand that materials universe. Um, and, you know, again, I think Canada's working really hard at that in terms of economically, how do we get a bigger materials universe so that you're you're maybe not fixed with the, this, you know, well, what one material are you going to do? And again, e e companies need to be good at what they do. So it does make sense um, to, you know, may maybe you are really good at titanium, um, but, you know, you're probably also good at Inconel and, uh, and and you probably don't do plastic. So I'm not sure if that, that answers it, but, but yeah, there's, there's, there's no really good answer. Um, and again, you know, a lot of these technologies, you know, I think the missing, the elephant in the room there is, you know, well, what's, you know, maybe what's the best technology? What are you, what are you trying to do with that? Um, this combination of materials and machines and, and, and geometry. Okay, great. We have uh, some more questions here. Um, the next question is, it asks, is there any development on the powder qualification process? Do you think the powder bed density is another tri critical parameter to track? Uh, do I think it's a critical parameter to track? Uh, um, I don't have it. I don't have enough uh, experience in that area to really answer it. But um, I, I think th there are many parameters that uh, affect the process for sure. And one of the interesting approaches is how do you try to narrow down the hundreds of parameters that have some impact? to a, a set that that is manageable uh, and lets you deliver consistent deliver consistent product so it wouldn't be on the top of my thought list of uh, of, of things that you should be really careful with but as i said before um it is a constant hat eating competition and um you, you know i'm not saying it's not in i'm not saying it's not important but it wouldn't be top of my mind Okay, uh, another question from Mark. He asks, what metal has the best future in the direct energy deposition and large radius robotic arm? Um, so you should definitely be asking people like uh, Tonya Wolf out west. You could ask uh, Promation. You could ask, Water you could ask Waterloo. We've got lots of people in that. I would say direct energy deposition has a very bright future, pardon the pun. Um, because here I think the value proposition is let's put down material very quickly, but maybe not supremely accurately, um, but we'll put lots of material down just where we need it. And then we will come in and we will machine it um, uh, back to where it's where it's critical. And we're very, very good at machining. And I think the analogy here, Sean, is a little bit like the, the tension between airplanes made in aluminium and airplanes made in composites. And, you know, we've become really, really good at making airplanes in aluminium. Um, and we're really, really good at machining. So, um, you know, again, I think directed energy uh, is definitely uh, one of those technologies that is supremely interesting. Of course, it's very scalable as well. Uh, and we do, you know, it's 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 welding, um, and as as many of these processes are, 
um, but it, it's a, it has a very exciting future. I think it's very underexploited right now. Um, so, you know, in terms of what's the best metal, um, you know, uh, I, I would just get on, I would just get, get on and do it again. It's what problem are you trying to solve? And, you know, people like Norsk are uh, using titanium for Boeing uh, in, I think they're in New York, um, using directed, using directed energy. And we've got uh, people using, you, you can repair with directed energy. So you can either make brand new components or you can repair. And of course, we've got great capability in Canada. One of the companies I didn't talk about was Berloc and, and their work with NRC and laser consolidation where maybe we can do uh, directed energy with a uh, really fine resolution as well. So that's, you know, that, that could be uh, a game changer. So, um, you know, everything to play for, Sean. Okay. Well, and I think one of the themes I've picked up from answering some of these questions, uh, Mark, is, is sometimes you need to back up from the question a little bit, like your comment right now. What's the question you're trying to solve? Don't, don't start with the end in mind necessarily. Start with the, the problem you're trying to solve. Um, we have another one here from David. Uh, he, again, he asked a very specific question, but I think it's a good one. Um, to form an aerospace component about the size of a coffee cup out of stainless, how much would a machine be? <laughs> that is a great. That is a great question, and, and I and I, sus, I sus, sorry, was it David who asked it? I suspect yeah. maybe he knows the answer. Um, it's all changing is is the and what we're seeing is that there is a, um, a potential uh, I'll use Autodesk's favorite term but a democratization potentially of additive manufacturing and we saw with the X1 uh, design lab machine um, and they're not the, the only company where we have desktop capable metal machines that are now um, I won't say in the thousands of dollars, but they're in the tens of thousands. They're not in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Um, so, you know, different machines with different capabilities. Um, you know, one of the old things was you, you sort of, you pay your money, it takes your choice. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we are seeing now, I think things that, that, you know, I didn't think would be possible, Sean, uh, uh, when I started I only, you know, six, seven years ago in this, when, when we started with single laser machines, we were sort of 10 cc's an hour. And then we went to quad laser machines and 100 cc's an hour was possible. Now SLM has a 12, le 12 laser monster machine uh, promising 1,000 cc's an hour. So there's definitely, th there's a Moore's law going on. You know, a lot of the complaints are often, you know, the machines are too slow, they're too expensive. Um, but there, there really is, you know, we've seen three orders of magnitude improvement in uh, laser powder bed. And of course, the, the pushback on that would be, ah, yeah, but, you know, is the machine now three orders of magnitude more expensive? No, it's not, but it is more expensive. So again, it's about how do we deliver, how do we deliver more value? But I think the, the coffee cup size component is, it's a really, it's becoming a very heavily contested space, which, which is great for the, for the customer. It's great for Canadian industry that you have many more choices now. And, and again, you know, get out there, start learning the language um, would be, you know, uh, what I would encourage. Okay, great. So we have some more questions. From a contract manufacturing perspective, customers often require the assembly of metal parts, but do not necessarily specify the manufacturing method of those parts. The question is, how can we, man we how can manufacturers elevate whether parts, sorry, evaluate whether parts made additively are same fit and function as parts made subtractively? Just asking your thoughts. Uh... Okay, tough. Well, you know, I suppose um, there's an engineering drawing or an engineering model. You know, they're either they're they're either correct to spec or they're not. Um, so uh, I would say that additively, you know, um, it's it's not normally a choice of of am I going to make it additively or am I going to make it? Uh, you know, am I going to fabricate it? Um, there are there are cases like that, uh, but typically I think that um, we're going to see more of an evolution where you're going to look you're going to just 
as the design knowledge um, becomes more widespread, you're going to get a component and you're going to immediately know that it's an additive component in the same way that you'll have no confusion. Am I going to put it on a lathe or a milling machine? Um, or, you, you know, you just wouldn't be, am I going to have to wire EDM that feature? Um, it's clearly designed for that. I think we will, we will see, um, and we're already seeing that there are some parts where it's clearly, um, let's just say it's a very funky shape and you immediately sort of think additive, but it, but it's often then not quite so clear, Sean, whether, uh, the solution is, uh, should I print a sand mold and cast it? Or, you know, should I try to print it direct? Um, uh, but, you know, the business the business case is always what's going to dictate um, the approach that you take. Great. All right. And another one. Um, so additive manufacturing has been known for its lean manufacturing and environmentally friendly, uh, I guess, outcomes, ultimately. In reality, we do see a lot of powder waste. Any comments on this? Any possibility we can cut down material costs by reducing this waste? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I think the biggest, the biggest uh, barrier to the sort of the waste, the sustainability, is uh, it, is not so much how much powder we waste because in practice. Um, say for laser powder bed, you would waste very little material. Um, directed energy, you might waste a little, little bit more because you're because you're maybe spraying powder or blowing powder. But again, you could be using wire, in which case you, you know you're really wasting nothing. Um, I think the the bigger question we have to address is this: Well, I use ten times less, but it costs ten times more. And then, hey, it was ten times slower, and then now it's now now I'm at a now I'm at a net loss. Um, so the, 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 I think we have to take a life cycle approach um, to all of this. And, and again, trying to minimize the waste of, of powder is probably, you know, it, it's, it's one point in, in the continuum. We need to look at the, you know, there's some interesting work going on at Loughborough on looking at the complete energy use uh, in these cycles and, and, you know, how do we use lasers effectively? Um, is 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 one is one area. So the the powder is definitely it's it's part of the equation. But again, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be my number one thing. We're wasting too much powder. Um, that that wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be one of my sort of top three barriers to adoption. Okay. Um, do you already see a new generation of engineers who grew up, grew up with additive manufacturing and can't design <clears throat> for traditional manufacturing techniques anymore? <laughs> um it, a loaded question uh do i is there a new generation yes um and and then it said and can't design for conventional anymore uh maybe they've never done you know maybe they've they've never known any, anything different I, I think uh how what we really want are sort of the, the the polymaths if you like who can who can work with any manufacturing process um and and make sensible decisions and again, software is is coming to our aid here with the ability to evaluate different manufacturing, pro not just different materials uh, and different stress outcomes or constraints, but let's look at it from a life cycle perspective. Um, what what are the different scenarios that typically an expert will be able to see different ways of making components sometimes of course we're blinded by our experience and we can only see the way that we know we know best um so i i often really like the fact that people coming into the industry come with no baggage um and you know it's it but but the idea of mentoring and and transferring knowledge and and how can software help us particularly when we're all working remotely right now you know how can how can software Tell you, tell you what the outcome is likely to be. I think that's a really exciting direction for us. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm I, I I I've seen amazing things from first robotics community colleges, uh, people who've who've you know retrained within the industry. So uh, you know, I think there are a few people who get involved in this that don't kind of uh, become fairly well addicted to it. Great. So are the, from your perspective, are the greatest challenges to additive manufacturing adoption technical or are they organizational, Mark? Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question. Technical or organizational. Uh, 
I, I think I'm going to say it's organizational um, because I think it's like, you know, I come back to, to uh, uh, it's about having a vision, um, you know, and m maybe organizationally, uh, you know, we, we just did a survey uh, within the, the automation and robotics sector and, and uh, you know, it's a tough sell automation and robotics um, and maybe not as not as tough as a million dollar uh, metal printer might be, but it's still a tough it's still a tough sell. People are very flexible and companies are busy and there's often a perception that, you know, uh, the company's not going to die today and it's not going to die tomorrow. And there's always a bigger um, there's always a bigger emergency. And I think that there's maybe, you know, I don't know what the number is. I'm going to make it up, Sean, but I, there's maybe 20% of companies um, that really uh, have a have a more of a culture of innovation. They really want to grow. They want to scale. I think, you know, they're the companies who are likely, are most likely to adopt. We saw at the beginning in that survey, didn't we, where, um, a lot of the early adopters actually were were speculative, and we looked at the story of of Tronos. It's it's not exactly a, a sequitur that you go from converting one four sixes into water bombers into additive manufacturing. Um, so maybe it's not for maybe it's not for everyone, uh, and you know that that probably is a cultural organizational thing um, rather than a a, a technical thing. I don't mean to be too negative there, but I think that no, I think no. is just true. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. So here's our, our last question, but probably a good one to to end on. Um, what do you think are the top three pain points in adopting metal additive manufacturing? Top three pain points. Um, the okay, what is you, you know? Let's come back. What problem are we trying to solve? Um, do you have a good do you have a good problem to solve um it i think anybody who's had a business uh likes it likes it when they get a call from their customer and the customer says we're really in trouble can you help um that that's all that's always a great one as opposed to the customer says oh we want a price reduction of 30 percent, or we're going to resource all of your parts um and, and i've certainly certainly been on been on both ends of that so what do you, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, and again, hopefully the the run through showed that uh, whether it's maybe it is maybe legacy components, whether it's better perform better performance with using using lattices there. It, what is your what is your what is your vision? Um, the price point has been a barrier, but I think that's a, a that's a perceived barrier rather than a real one. There are a lot of ways to get into this that don't involve spending a lot of money. Uh, collaborating on a project, working with these organizations would would be great. Um, but what 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 I would say is the uh, the temptation to wait for something better to come along versus the how much organizational learning can you do by getting involved i i, I think there's <laughs> i have no data to support my hand waving here sean but i do think that there's a trade off between waiting and learning uh, and i would i i don't think it costs much to start learning so that would be you know uh, get ngen to c connect you um, with with an organization and start learning. There's only so much we can do in webinars and that we do have to probably get hands on. And I'm a big fan of that. That's yeah. probably a good place to end. Great. Well, Mark, I really appreciate, um, you know, uh, unfortunately the videos didn't work. And as I mentioned, we will get them out to everybody who uh, signed up for today to join us. But on the flip side, we filled that time with a lot of great questions. So, you know, things happen for a reason. Uh, you've answered all the questions very well. And, and uh, hopefully those of you who, um, have joined us here today have walked away with some insights whether you're somebody already heavily involved in additive manufacturing or i think there's a lot of questions specific to where to start and, and some of the themes that you mentioned mark are you know what problem are you trying to solve what are you already good at that might be the best place to to start and then really start to learn uh, reaching out to engine whether it be myself frank uh, you know we can connect them with yourself as well mark is, is a great pay a great way to get plugged in if it is something you you want to look at we can help you connect you with the right folks ultimately to uh, help you move forward in that journey so really want to thank you for your time today mark i look forward to you joining us mark as well as those of you here next thursday at 11 a.m 
for our roundtable discussion. Uh, there'll be lots more to discuss. And I think Mark will share what, what we may do is tee up a video. One of the best ones that you have, Mark, for next week as a, as a kickoff. So if you I, I think that would, that, would, that would be great because I think I probably, the one I, I feel uh, um, maybe people have seen Precision's video, but we did have one on research going on. So if we get that chance, that, that would be good. Well that's, Thanks, what we'll, Sean. that's what we'll plan to do. So we'll make it up, but you have to come back if you want to participate. So thanks everybody. Make sure you join us next Thursday, 11 a.m. I will send an email with the detail. We will share these slides. Thank you very much for your comments, your questions, and again, for joining us here at our What's Next Thought Leadership Series. Uh, everybody stay safe. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Sean.